Hi, I'm Jeff Schloss. I'm professor of biology at Westmont College where I direct the Center for Faith, Ethics, and Life Sciences, and I'm also senior scholar at the BioLogos Foundation. So I actually am interested in and work in two areas. Um, one area involves human altruistic behavior or sacrificial care of others and religious and moral cognition and how these relate to our biology. What dispositions we might have toward uh, these things, what limitations we might have uh, on these things, and what are the outcomes, what are the impacts on human flourishing of giving ourselves to these things. The other area I'm interested in goes beyond my own work. I'm really fascinated and interested in the work of other biologists and in collaboration with philosophers, uh, we have explored the implications for kind of the big questions uh, in faith, natural evil, the question of purpose and design, the question of human exceptionalism uh, in evolutionary theory. So wh what are the goals of asking questions like this? Well, first of all, like in all science, uh, the, the the ultimate goal should just be finding out how the world works and, and it's fun. The goal is just the fun of discovery. Uh, it's really fascinating to explore how we're made. Um, but there's another uh, goal as well, uh, especially in, in this area, understanding how we're made, understanding how uh, life itself evolved and took form over time, it informs our understanding of ourselves. It informs what goals it seems reasonable to, to seek and what impact of attaining or missing those goals has on our own lives. And then there's even a third goal, and that, that third goal is um, making sense of how the, all these ideas relate to our faith and also um, how these ideas relate and, and our perspective on these ideas, how that enables us to relate to the wider culture on issues that have, are really polarized and which really sadly divide us. So I, I think every scientist and for every inquirer has a general sense of, of why questions might matter, but there might be very specific uh, personal reasons they might matter as well. And actually for, for me, there are a couple. Uh, I think that I would share this with a number of my colleagues. Uh, it is, it's not only just personally fun to do inquiry, but science in particular is inquiry in the context of a community. So it's just, uh, I, I wouldn't have anticipated this myself a, as a student, but it's both challenging and tremendously rewarding to get input from your colleagues who may approach issues from different perspectives and different points of view, uh, saying, wow, um, good insight, or no, you really got this wrong. So the scriptures you know, say iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And that's my personal experience of the enterprise of science itself. And it's not only personally rewarding, but I have found that it builds bridges of friendship and commerce uh, across con uh, constituencies that otherwise in our culture are oftentimes at odds. Uh, I think it's fun, but I think the enterprise itself is intrinsically important. You know, why would anybody care uh, about this area uh, of research? Um, two reasons. I mean, one reason is I, I just hope people care about uh, learning new things. I don't want to presume that everybody will be interested in my particular area. I mean, people can love to learn poetry or, or music or geology or physics, but uh, boy, it's, it's fun to learn. And I regret the fact that that, that playful inquiry is, seems to be diminishing as a, as a cultural value. So I hope people will care. But secondly, these particular questions, I think, inform our understanding of how we're made, uh, what goals or uh, ultimate ends in human existence are uh, worthy of attaining and what are attainable, uh, what impediments uh, exist uh, to their attainment. And so these, these questions are really fundamental uh, to how we understand and live our lives. And then that's for everyone. And then f for Christians in, in particular, the questions of uh, how these ideas of our organic constitution as biological uh, creatures, how those relate to the scriptural view of what it means to be made in uh, God's image. Uh, frankly, I, I can't imagine a more uh, important question.
Well, there does seem to be uh, not only the biological capacity, of course, but but even uh, a, a drive uh, to learn, and that's that's true uh, constitutionally. But then uh, humans have this really fascinating and unique capacity to pass on intergenerationally uh, the fruits of our learning. So in human culture, learning is cumulative. A actually, there's some evidence that we some see some of that in non-human cultures as well. Uh, but what ratchets this up to the next level is, um, first of all, the capacity to uh, not just learn by observation, but to learn by intentional instruction. Uh, and then secondly, we encode our learning in symbols. And so that that's, appears to be uniquely and crucially human. So a big question I encounter all the time with my students and church people and even secular colleagues is how on earth can evolution be reconciled uh, with the Christian faith? On one level, there, there is no single answer to that because there's so many issues. There's historiographic issues of the age of the earth and who were the first humans and when were they? There are larger doctrinal issues of image of God and the fall. And then there are even larger issues like natural evil and design and purpose. So there's no single answer, but I think there is is a single approach. And the single approach is this. The 19th Psalm says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies are the work of his hands. And then it also says, the law of the per Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. So this is the first, uh, one of the first suggestions of what's come to be called the two books. We know God through the book of nature. We know God through the book of scripture. Now, what do we do when they seem to conflict? And actually, the end of the psalm seems to suggest what to do, where the psalmist says, Lord, deliver me from hidden faults. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. What should we do to reconcile? This may sound uh, overly simplistic, but the first step is pray. If there seems to be conflict between the book of nature and the book of scripture, we made a mistake someplace. We're either not understanding nature or not understanding the Bible, and it's presumptuous to decide in advance where we have made a mistake. So we ask God, open-mindedly, I've made a mistake, help me understand where I've made it. So I get asked, um, what's altruism and why is it so important to, to, to study it? So first of all, um, altruism has classically been defined as giving without expectation of return or radically unselfish care of others. Biologists add something else to that. That's a question of motives. Biologists say, yeah, and for it to be altruistic, the consequences have to be self-sacrificial, not just the motives. So that's what altruism is. Why is it so important? Because that notion of altruism is such a fascinating biological question. Uh, the Harvard evolutionary biologist uh, E.O. Wilson says it's the central theoretical question in trying to understand the biological basis of social behavior. Um, and he, he goes on to say that um, the human level of cooperation is, quote unquote, the culminating mystery of all biology. How on earth do you get biology that is not only unselfishly motivated, but consequentially sacrificial? So it's a huge question in biology. And in the Abrahamic face, in Christianity in particular, it's posited to be the ultimate goal of human existence. So in biology is, how does this come about? Uh, in Christianity is, uh, it's the ultimate goal. And the only way to live fully is by giving your life away. So I, actually, I have to be honest, in terms of the, the nexus, the interaction uh, between uh, science and, and religion, I, I don't conceive of a more fascinating and more important question. So do I see God in my work? Um, I, I see God in my life. I, I believe that I'm here by his grace and actually by his, by his intervention. Many of my dearest friends uh, from my younger days didn't make it through that passage. So I, I, I'm here by the faithfulness and involvement of God in my life. Do I see him in my work? Um, a lot of people mean by that, well, do I feel that um, my work has, has demonstrated or, or found something about the truths of God? That te technically, uh, traditionally, is called natural theology. And um, uh, for me, it's actually the reverse. Rather than ending up 
discovering God in my work, I've started there. I have sought intentionally to put him there and honor him as a beginning point in two ways. First of all, to, to do it in a way that, that would honor truth seeking. I have lots of colleagues who aren't uh, religious believers uh, who do the same thing, but uh, for me, telling the truth, seeking the truth, admitting when I'm wrong uh, in his name is central. But, the, but this, the second area, and here's where I both put and see God in my work, uh, the philosopher Al Plantinga uh, talks about what he calls theistic science, which is not the, the attempt to prove God from science, but the attempt to take what we already believe on the basis of revelation and allow that to inform our hypotheses or hunches about what might be true and then investigate it based on that. Now, you have to play fair. You can't just be a lawyer and try to prove your case. Uh, you have to truly inquire open-mindedly, get feedback from colleagues who don't have the same starting place. But the bottom line is, uh, I've had God in my work from the very beginning as the questions I ask are informed by my hunches about what's true on the basis of his revelation. What do I want people to take away from my work, and, and by the way, this isn't a theoretical question. I, I actually think of it in terms of my own children. What, what do I want them to believe about life and in what way might uh, my interests and work contribute to that? And there, there are two things. Um, the first of all, the first thing is that ultimately our way of understanding the world scientifically and theologically, uh, there are challenges, but there's no uh, irreconcilable conflict. And in fact, in many of the most important respects, there's congruence. Specifically, I, I think we're built to flourish uh, in loving others. Um, the scriptures say that um, it's by giving that we receive, and I think a, 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 f a lot of empirical work uh, on that substantiates that. But, but secondly, uh, and, and that morality and religion play really crucial roles in that. But secondly, that's not the end of the story. Um, we have conflicting biological dispositions. And moral and religious systems can themselves be toxic. So you have this, uh, we're not angels. Um, I, the bottom line is, um, takes me back to this wonderful quote by Blaise Pascal. He says, man is neither angel nor brute. And the unfortunate thing is, and here he expects him to say, if you think you're an animal, you're gonna act like it. But he doesn't. He says, he who would play the angel plays the brute. If we don't recognize both the capacities but also the limitations of our biological limitations, uh, we're unlikely to achieve those distinctives um, that are most crucial to our humanity. I is there anything in, in my work or the general relationship between um, science and faith that isn't getting adequate airtime uh, in my view? And, and there actually is. Um, and here I want to speak to uh, Christians in particular and the so cultural perceptions of Christians. There's been uh, well over a century of em emphatic attention to the relation of evolutionary theory to traditional Christian faith. That gets a lot of airtime. Uh, unfortunately, a fair amount of the airtime uh, involves uh, polar extremes and distortions, I think. But, but what isn't getting airtime is not just the questions of the origins of creation, but the care of creation. So uh, somebody I respect a lot, Cal DeWitt, is fond of saying that um, when we get to heaven, we're not going to be asked how old we thought the earth was, but what we did to take care of it. And I know that these questions are culturally um, extremely prominent, but I do think my fellow believers have been slow to engage them at the very deepest levels. Um, not just of what we can do politically, socially, in terms of economic structures, but what we can do in terms of perhaps a unique Christian of uh, a contribution to the faith tradition, which is where we draw our ultimate fulfillment from, and therefore what, which is commerce with one another and with God, and therefore how we can release our grip on uh, the creation and consumption of the creation. I'd love to see Christians much more emphatically address these issues.